The reading this morning is taken from the book of Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 to 23. Colossians 2, verses 8 to 23. See it, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ and been buried with him in baptism, in which you were ra also raised through him, through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to this world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with, with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Sue. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray as we unpack this passage together. Father, would you be glorified today through what we hear from your word, through the words that I say, May we know you and the fullness of your gospel and be transformed by it for your glory. Amen. So we are continuing in our series on Colossians, which those of you in life groups are also following along as well. And as a reminder, this is a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae, which is uh, in what is now Southwest Turkey. And Paul's writing from prison. And it's not to a church that he founded. In fact, he's never visited them, but he's heard about them uh, from their founder, Epaphras. So he's been encouraged by them, but he's also got some specific concerns that he wants to raise with them. And as we've been hearing over the past few weeks, Paul is saying that the Colossians have started out well in faith and love and hope, but he's warning them about false teachings. He's reminding them who Christ is, who God is, and what he's done for them, for all of us. Jesus should be our confidence in life. Jesus Christ, the awesome ruler of the universe, who became a man to reconcile us to God, triumphing over death and sin at the cross. Jesus is the Lord of all, as expressed in that amazing poem in, in chapter one of this letter. And we heard last week, he's our rock. Our foundation should be in God, in the God of eternity, the God of history, and in Christ, the cornerstone, our rock. 
So then we come to today's passage where Paul goes into much greater detail about the dangers, the false teachings um, that are threatening to lead the church in Colossae astray from those firm foundations in Christ and the sufficiency of Christ and his victory at the cross. This is the gospel, full stop. We don't need anything else. So we're going to look at three things. First of all, what were those false teachings that were in danger of leading this young church astray? Secondly, how do those teachings undermine the gospel and our confidence in Christ? And thirdly, what might be some of the equivalent traps for us today and how, would, how can we respond to those? So first of all then, what were the false teachings that were um, threatening this church, what were leading, uh, in danger of leading them astray? What are these hollow and deceptive philosophies that Paul describes in verse 8, which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world? And I'm calling these Jesus plus. And it sounds firstly as though there was an expectation amongst some of the church that Gentile converts, so um, those that hadn't been brought up in the Jewish faith, would follow, as they um, become Christians, would also fully follow the Jewish law. So Jesus plus the law. And Paul talks in the passage about circumcision in particular, so it's likely that that was part of the teaching that uh, Gentile converts should be circumcised. And that would have sounded like fine-sounding arguments, as Paul calls them in verse 4, because circumcision, remember, had been God's idea. As we read in the Old Testament, circumcision was a sign given originally to Abraham and practiced by the people of Israel to demonstrate the covenant, the binding promise between God and his people. It showed that you belong to God's chosen people. But Paul says, no, now we have a different way. We have in verse 11, the circumcision done by Christ. By accepting Jesus and what he has done for us, we have been joined to this body. We are in Christ. We belong to God. We don't need circumcision anymore. What else do we hear about these false teachings? Well, we've got rules about eating and drinking in verse 16. And these uh, refer to aspects of the Jewish law that set God's people aside. And they're also related to the sacrificial system that's laid out in the Old Testament, which was a way of dealing with breaches of the law and atoning for or covering sin, enabling people to make things right and maintain relationship with God and with the community. But these laws, this system, Paul says, are a shadow of things to come. And indeed, Jesus himself says in, in Matthew's gospel, for example, you might remember from our series earlier in the year, that Jesus has come to fulfill the law. The law has been fulfilled in Christ. And we'll come back to that a bit later. And through the cross, he has obtained eternal redemption once and for all setting us free and we read about that for example in the letter to the hebrews so we who follow christ don't any longer need to follow that system of rules about what food and drink is clean and unclean about sacrifice there are also these rules about festivals and sabbath that we hear about also in verse 16. And here you might be reminded of many of Jesus's encounters in the Gospels. There are a number of stories where Jesus himself was accused by the Pharisees and the Jewish teachers of undermining the law, particularly around the Sabbath. For example, in Mark's Gospel in chapter 2, the disciples go through the fields eating um, ears of corn on the Sabbath. And there's a criticism from the Pharisees. And Jesus replies and he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. 
and another time he heals on the Sabbath, several times actually, and that's one of the things that really infuriates the Pharisees. Uh, remember, those were the, um, the Jewish people who are really um, super religious, if you like, keeping all the rules and regulations as much as they could, seeking to honor and glorify God that way. So in Mark chapter 3, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand, um, and the gospel says in verse 6 that the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, Jesus, how to destroy him. So we see that there was a controversy about this, even when Jesus was alive and teaching, and we see it here again continued in the early church. Whether and how we keep festivals and Sabbath rules, whether we're following the rules of the old religion or following the one who is the ruler of all. And then uh, we have um, this odd phrase. So that's all the kind of Jesus plus the law. Then we go on, we have this odd phrase in verse 18 about not letting anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify us from the prize. And that seems to refer to a local religion that was venerating angels. And there's been some archaeological uh, findings that have supported that. But more generally, we can say that this was about people who are making a big deal of special spiritual experiences. So this is Jesus plus spiritual experiences. Not to say that those are wrong in themselves, and God can use those and speak to us through those, but it sounds as though some people in this church were focusing on those experiences instead of depending on Christ. And it was leading them uh, to be quite arrogant and proud, and it was making other people feel left out for not having, have, not having such spiritual experiences. And then finally, we have, again, false humility, but particularly around rules about eating and drinking. So this is where Paul is describing this in verses 20 to 23. And that could reflect an approach that we might call aestheticism. So focusing on kind of harsh discipline and ethics, which might appear ultra religious, but again, actually are based on, on human action as a way to please God. So Jesus plus lifestyle, if you like. And again, this is another dead end in comparison to the gospel of grace. So let's get into that now, the second point that I want to make. We've heard what these teachings were. How then do these teachings undermine the gospel, undermine our confidence in Christ? And Paul really gets into the, this in the middle of the passage that we've heard from verses 9 to 15. And it's a beautiful passage, as is much of this letter. So I'd really encourage you to reread uh, this section in particular. And the key thing here is that all these false teachings point to things that we can do, human actions, human achievements, as a way to life, as a way to salvation. So they're detracting from the basic gospel message that it's all Christ and his saving power. The way to life in all its fullness is not by following some rules or seeking some special experiences or living in a particular way. He, Jesus, is the one who saves. We cannot save ourselves. So we don't need Jesus plus anything. We just need Jesus. Let's go back to what uh, Jesus said himself in that passage I referred to about the law. And, um, and that, as I said, was a source of some confusion at the time that Jesus was living and teaching and in the early church, in this church in particular in Colossae, but some others as well. So in that Matthew passage, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, he has not come to abolish the law. Not the smallest letter will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So how then does that fit with what Paul's teaching here to the church in Colossae about not following the rules of the Jewish law? Well, it's because Jesus has fulfilled the purpose of the law. The law is a foreshadowing of what he will accomplish on the cross. 
The law was given as part of God's covenant, as we've said, a sign of his relationship with his people to enable right relationship with him and within the community. But Jesus has lived and died to show God's love for us, to enable us to have right relationship with him and one another once and for all. Jesus Christ, God made man, is the only perfect one who can keep the law fully. And then he takes on the cross the supreme act of sacrifice. So no other sacrifice is necessary. And if you remember his words on the cross, it is finished. So the law also just only deals with the consequences of sin, with actions, whereas Jesus, we know, is concerned with our heart, with our attitude, with what's on the inside. And actually that passage I've mentioned where he talks about fulfilling the law comes just after the Beatitudes, which we spent a lot of time on earlier in the year, that higher standard of love, of heart attitude that we're called to. So in Christ, we almost take things to the next level. We're not any longer living in the shadow of things, but in the fullness of what God is calling us to. And how, how can we possibly live in this higher standard? How can we live in Christ? Well, Paul reminds us that it's all God through our faith, verse 12, in the power of God. God made us alive with Christ, verse 13. He forgave us. He disarmed the powers and authorities, verse 15. He triumphed over them by the cross. Christ has reconciled us to God. He's lived the perfect life which none of us could. He's defeated death, risen from the dead, and won the victory against the powers and authorities that stand against God. God loved us first. He did this for us. What an amazing gospel. Why on earth then would we try to add to it by going back to a set of rules and regulations, a way of living to try and make things right with God when we can't even do that? But we do try, don't we? We do expect to try to contribute, but, but we can't. Going back to the old religion or our ways of trying to live right, to the um, spiritual experiences perhaps, these things might make us feel safe or good about ourselves, but putting our trust in them is, Paul says, deceptive and hollow. Only God in Christ can save us. So then what might be, thirdly, some of the equivalent traps for us today? And how can we respond? What might we be seeking to have as Jesus plus when we try and live out our faith? And when I was thinking about this and reflecting on some of the things that are often mentioned here, good things, again, good things like regular devotional times, going to church, acts of service, but things that we can twist uh, into things that we rely on and put our trust in. I was struck by how they relate, as Paul very clearly says, to a wider philosophy, a hollow and deceptive philosophy, as he puts it. And that's really a philosophy of relying on ourselves and on human achievement. And I think in our culture, often that express, as is expressed, as a culture of busyness, of doing things, good things, but finding our worth and our purpose in those things. How many of us use busyness as a shield, a response to peop people who want to get close to us, a response even to God who wants us to get close to him? How many of us deep down might at least partly be doing the things we do in church for others out of a sense of seeking approval, seeking ultimately God's approval, when in reality his grace is sufficient? God loves you. He has made the first move and he is enough. Don't choose Jesus plus, simply choose Jesus. 
And spiritual experiences, again, these are good, and God provides us with these as a way of encountering him, as a way of encountering the power of his Holy Spirit, an act of grace. But let's not put those things on a pedestal, feeling proud if we've had them, and guilty or lesser than if we haven't. Let's simply focus on Jesus, and the rest, as Jesus says elsewhere, will follow. And then aestheticism, which maybe is less common in our religious practice today than it has been at some points in history. But I was thinking it might actually be found in kind of ethical living, things that are quite close to my heart and I've talked about here before. And again, there's nothing wrong with trying to cut our carbon footprint or reducing our consumerism even things like flying less or eating less meat. Perhaps those are a bit more controversial. But these are things that we can, these are things that we can do as part of trying to steward God's creation, trying to tread lightly on the earth. But let's not make an idol of them either. Let's not think we can earn our acceptance into the kingdom through those things. God has done it all, and we don't need to run around doing stuff to earn our place in his kingdom. Hear me right, I'm not denigrating those things, acts of service, loving one another, spending time serving in church, doing things for God, caring for one another, caring for creation. I'm not saying we should stop doing any of those things, but let's look into our hearts and see. Do we know that Jesus, who is fully God, has already done everything and he has done it because he is love and he loves you he went to the cross for you his victory is total there is nowhere else to find truth and confidence and if we know that deeply know that then that power that paul describes the power that defeated the powers of the world the power over every power, the power that's already forgiven you and can equip you to know him more deeply, can also equip you to love and serve from that place of power. So we can fully rest in God. We can know that deep rest. So if you are worn out trying to stay busy, trying to achieve, trying to earn God's approval or love, stop. Rest in his presence today. Ask him to show you what he has done for you and that he is enough and that you don't need to add anything. And as I invite the band to come back up, I think many of us are feeling tired and weary. So hear this again. God has done it. He is running towards you. He loved you from the beginning, and he is enough for you. And I'm going to reread Paul's words from that middle section from Colossians, from the message translation, just to give us a fresh perspective. You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. Entering into this fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws. No, you're already in. Insiders, not through some secret initiation rite, but rather through what Christ has already gone through for you, destroying the power of sin. While you were still stuck in your old sin-dead life, God brought you alive right along with Christ. To God be the glory. Amen. <laughs>